Live from Seville, this is The Twilight Show with Harry Waters and you are listening live. Hello everybody, so time for a reboot, a restart. We're kicking off all over again because guess what? That's what happens sometimes. Let's see if things work better this time around. So um, I have sent my guest a new link um, and in the meantime, I'm going to pop the, the news on so we can hear that and I'm going to give Ron the new link and we're going to get started right now. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Katz Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you, too, through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles, and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.weatherslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. ITV News reports on the workload of educational psychologists in Gateshead, who say they are overwhelmed as the number of children needing special educational help has risen by 117% in eight years. This has placed a strain on SEND services in the area, but the load has been especially large for EPs. Deborah Mason, Service Manager for SEND in Gateshead, said that there had been a wait for some people to complete their doctorate, although assistant ed psychs have been used to enhance the team. This report comes shortly after the Secretary of State for Education in England, Gillian Keegan, sent a message to the education and care sector about SEND reform. In the message, Ms Keegan said she believed that pupils and students should always be able to get a high quality education and receive the right support. She acknowledged the challenges of a complex system but said that her department wanted to take time to listen to children and parents, as well as those in the system, before publishing a response to the SEND and Alternative Provision Green Paper. An improvement plan would be published in the new year, she added. Part of the plan would include investing £21 million into training 400 more educational psychologists. For young people in areas like Gateshead, this funding can't come soon enough. The BBC News website reports on claims that the University of Derby has suspended a student for taking her baby into lectures. The female student is halfway through a degree and a tutor had agreed to her taking her son to lectures as a short-term measure, but this was later overruled. As the student was breastfeeding, she felt she had no option to continue, but was suspended two weeks ago. The student believes she has been discriminated against because she has a baby but stated she had never allowed her son to disrupt the learning of others. A university spokesman said areas were available on campus for those who needed to breastfeed, but that taking a baby or child into lectures was not allowed for health and safety reasons. Meanwhile, Ulster University has defended itself against claims that it plans to open a campus in Qatar and that will have a negative impact on LGBTQ rights. The university is due to open the campus in Doha in January next year. Speaking on BBC Radio Ulster, Hannah McCulloch, chair of the LGBT Society on the university's Colrain campus, said she is worried that the university is putting financial gain over a community within their community and that it will damage the establishment's reputation. A spokesman for the university said, Ulster University believes that education is a route for societal growth and that many UK universities had partnerships with countries across the Middle East. 
In Wales, the government has announced free Welsh lessons will be extended to the entire education workforce, including non-teaching staff. Alongside this, a new framework for Welsh in English medium schools has been published, underlining how the Welsh language is integral to the new curriculum for Wales. A sabbatical course is also available for teachers to learn or improve their Welsh. Minister for Education and Welsh Language, Jeremy Miles, said, We want everyone to enjoy using the Welsh language. We are ambitious for our language and I am pleased to be able to extend the offer of free Welsh lessons to all school staff. Finally, in a week that saw the release of Department for Education statistics, which show a 20% drop in those entering the teaching profession, many media outlets comment on the possible impact on young people. The number of entrants to initial teacher training fell from 36,159 to 28,999 between 2021 and 22 and the 2022 to 23 training years. The government attributed the fall to the reduced number of new entrants and an increase in the target. But critics pointed out that the government's recruitment targets for secondary school teacher training has been missed in nine out of the last 10 years. A DfE spokesperson said, For teacher trainees in 2023, bursaries and scholarships in key subjects will be available, and we remain committed to raising the starting salary to £30,000. This has been your Teachers Talk Radio News with Joe Fox. This is Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Hello, did you get a bargain on Black Friday? This week I'm going to talk about deals. First, a little bit of history. Tom will be proud of me. Read it up on Wikipedia and seriously condensing what I found, the term Black Friday refers to the Friday after Thanksgiving when the Christmas shopping season starts. Supposedly, it started in the 1950s. Recently, it marked a time of serious bargains, riots and fighting for unbelievable deals. However, are you getting a bargain or are you just led to believe it? Seeing as last Friday was Black Friday, which began last Monday, and next week will still be Black Friday, or for some stores Cyber Monday or Cyber Week, when you get the best deals online, how do you know a price drop is actually a deal? Well, the short answer is you don't. I have a couple of pointers here that may help you, but the underlying advice is buyer beware. If I go with the best known online retailer, when using Amazon, there's a nifty little price tracking website called Camel Camel Camel. This will show you the price data for a product over the time it's been advertised. You can see when it was more expensive and less expensive. If you're on your phone, where most shopping takes place, hit the share icon found next to the product image, go to Camel 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 and paste it into the search box. You can even sign up to email alerts for price drops and add target discount alerts if you're not in a desperate hurry for an item. The next trick is to simply do a web search for the product. You may find it cheaper in a large supermarket store, and although you may need to go and collect it to save on postage, it may be worth the journey. There's also hundreds of coupon and price comparison sites where you may be able to find further discounts. The only caveat being the time you spend researching may actually outweigh the saving you make. I return to my initial warning. Buyer, beware. I hope you get a deal leading up to the holiday season. As always, I'd love to hear your favourite shopping online tips. Let us know at TTR2022. I'm Steve Woods, and that was Two Minute Tech. Two Minute Tech with Steve Woods, your tech briefing on Teachers Talk Radio. Ron, I can hear you. I can hear you loud and clear. We did it. We did it. We've achieved the impossible. Well, it's a little bit cold in Germany right now. So, you know, I'm just here in my home. Well, so you are there in your home, and that's where you you now uh, reside currently. But but can you tell us a bit about your your life, um, uh, a nutshell version of what your life has been and how you have come to where you are? Well, where do I start? Um, <laughs> well, I'm originally originally from from Houston, Texas, and. Um, went to school and university in Houston, Texas, uh, and uh, moved to New York to do my master's, uh, then moved to San Francisco, uh, then moved to London <laughs> to work for a company in London. Uh, and that company sent me to, to Mexico City, Buenos Aires, Hong Kong, uh, Geneva, uh, everywhere well wow, that is it's a real world tour uh and that was before the age of 28. oh wow that is that's impressive uh and so after that i 
I decided to travel a little bit just by myself uh, and wound up in France. Uh, and after that, I went back to the United States uh, and uh, a headhunter approached me for a job in Germany. And that's where you are now, because you told us before, I'm in Germany and it's cold. So how long have you been in Germany? I've lived in Germany permanently for 32 years. Oh, fantastic. But you haven't always been involved in CPD, have you? And you've not always been involved in English teaching. No, that's true. Um, I started actually uh, in London working as an HR manager uh, and uh, then moved to uh, human resource development. Uh, and from there, I decided that I would, um, uh, I, I was training people as I was traveling the world. Uh, and uh, one thing led to another, and I wound up with this job in Germany that would, uh, I came here as a consultant, actually, because I was a specialist in, uh, in learning organizations and learning within organizations. Uh, and my job was to help uh, I was working on a team, a consultancy team, to open one of the first German corporate universities. Oh, wow. Um, that's it. That's really impressive. And so, so from there, you kind of, how did you, how did you switch to, to English from that? I, I, where, how, where did the jump come? Well, I, when I was planning this, this, I was working on this planning committee, uh, Part of my job was to, because of my HR background, I had to staff the language program mm -hmm. and, you know, got to meet a lot of teachers and I had to train them on how to work in a corporate world because uh, we did have high expectations. Um, and um, that was my first encounter with the language teachers. And it must have been a good one. Yes and no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, because language teachers are not the same as language trainers. And there, there was a lot of discrepancies. Okay. Discrepancies led to um, us already deciding that that we had made a mistake in how we were recruiting. Oh, no. So we had to take a step back and and rethink what we were really doing. Uh, and uh, I realized that I would have to train the teachers we were going to hire. And that's how I started training teachers. And that was it. That was the that was the well, the spark, I guess, that, that started this this journey. Um, to being something of a of a of a, a training guru, should we say? I, I don't want to, you know. I know you you're, you're a very modest person, so um, if I call you a guru, you'll probably say, "No, no, Harry, not at all, not at all." But you are. So, <laughs> so let's get on to CPD. Now, I remember when I started teaching, CPD for me was well, it didn't exist really. It was Friday meetings that we had to do where we'd go and sit down and be talked out for an hour and then we'd leave and everyone would be like, that was pointless. Um, that was annoying. Um, and yeah, so CPD was kind of this horrible thing that nobody really wanted to do. But, but as I, I've stayed in, in the business for, for, for years that have gone past, I've met a lot of people and, and realized that, you know what, CPD is actually quite important. Now, I want to look at it from the way you talk about it, and that is self-directed CPD. So, well, I'll ask you, what is that? Well, can I take a step back and just uh, say how I actually realized what was going on? Uh, and when I I had staffed these programs, mm -hmm. I... I did meet a lot of teachers and I got to see their resumes and where they were working at. Yeah. And, and I started to contact the schools for references, you know, just to check things. Uh -huh. uh, and I started making connections with school owners 
uh, and also universities. And, and one of the universities offered me a job. Oh, wow. So it was, it came about like that. Was it, you know, like a, a serendipitous event kind of thing? Yeah, it was a, it was just a fluke. And I said, yes. <laughs> And I took over a language department at a private business college. And they, you know, told me that they wanted to redo the department. And they had 26 people working in the department. Well, that's a, that's a fair number to start I with. I wanted to restructure it. And that meant a lot of, of teacher observation, a lot of talks with teachers one-to-one, -one. Uh, having meetings, like you said, you know, like twice a week in the teacher's room, uh, getting them to express their ideas of what they were, you know, learning and how they taught. And then I realized that that they were teaching grammar. <laughs> and that's all they were teaching. <laughs> yeah, just lots of grammar. Uh, and we couldn't have that at a major private business college. And so my job, I realized, was I was going to have to retrain them. Oh, wow. That's, uh, that's, that's one hell of an undertaking, retraining 26 teachers all in one. Well, to be honest with you, Harry, I only wound up with 18. Oh, oh, oh. What happened to the other eight, may I ask? Some people are just not, not trainable. They're not coachable. Mm-hmm. They're not open to new ideas. They they can't deal with change. Uh, they wanted to use those course books, uh, and that's all they knew. They thought that's what teaching English was about. And you know, my goal was to get them to to the point of business communication training. It's it's bizarre. That's something I've never understood in teachers. When you know, so these these are people that are. You know, they're out there helping people grow, helping people learn, you know, watching people improve on, on a day to day basis. And then and then you'll meet one who, who doesn't want to improve themselves. And you just think, why are you doing this job if you if you don't want to improve yourself at all? Like, what? how can you be? It's, it's hypocritical to ask your students to want to improve if you're not interested That's in doing that yourself. Of the teaching industry. Uh, there's a lot of teachers who just want to teach. And then there's teachers who realize that teaching means learning. It absolutely does. I mean, I, I'm, I'm not sure who the quote was by. I can't remember. I, I, I do have it written down. Um, but as I mentioned, I've had to leave my office for, for sound reasons. Um, but it's the one um, about if you're still teaching the same now as you were five years ago, uh, then you know, you're, you're obviously doing something wrong. To, so, to paraphrase well, and yeah. in private business if you haven't grown within five years in a company it's time for you to go yeah uh, and you know not everybody grows in a job you know that that that's maybe doesn't work for everybody there's people who are very happy with what they do and they do it very well but you know with teaching that's different it really is. It really is. Learning. Sorry, go ahead. I interrupted you there. Yeah, well, you know, you've got to always be learning. It's and so important to me that, that, that you can't stop yeah. learning because everything's changing constantly with teaching. It's, it's not a business. It's not a thing. It's not a profession that stands still. Like every day there are new things to know. Every day there are new things to learn. So somebody who who sits there with this this grammar book and this idea of just teaching grammar it, it's it's unfathomable to me well you know there's a lot of people who do do that <laughs> uh, and you know that's that that's that power that publishers have in the in ELT world and that's the power that testing agencies have as well yeah because it does just become teach for the test and teach for the test. And uh, and it's a, a, a weird thing because as teachers, a lot of us, those of us who, who do, you know, want to learn and grow, particularly in ELT, you know, we want to get away from this, this grammar based learning. We want to get away from this exam hammering of, of students. But I know that here in Spain, like when a student comes to your class, you say, what, what's your goal? You know, where do you want to be in by the end of this course? Or where do you want to be in the next few years? And, 
and they say, I want the first certificate or, you know, I want to get the B2 certificate. And like that's been drummed into students, particularly here in Spain, as I say, and parents, you know, that the aim is to get that certificate. You know, that is what they need to do, because if you don't have that certificate, then you can't go to university. And and looking at it in that prescribed manner, it, it it's really sad as a teacher that wants to, you know, learn and grow with my students you know that what their aim is is to purely you know tick the right boxes well not every teaching context is the same of course so you know you've got your secondary school where they the teachers have to teach certain things there's a you know pre prescribed uh, curriculum yep uh, and they have to pass certain tests. Exactly. And here in Spain, it's primary schools as well. I mean, it's the whole way through. Like, you, there, there are these tests that just have to be taught. And, you know, I, I know that once you kind of get out of, you know, edu once you get out of set primary, secondary school and, and into university, there starts to be you know, a bit more kind of almost a bit more freedom um, in terms of, of what you can teach. Uh, but again, it all depends massively on the teacher and, and where they want to go and, and how they want to adapt these different things. So um, let's, let's well, you have... need to, I need to jump in there and say Please that, do. that there's a freedom of what teachers can teach. And the key word there is can. So in other words, and, and, and they, they can pick a topic and that's true that you know as as long as that fits into the curriculum but yeah. where the teachers really have a choice is how they teach exactly and so that's where i i really come in <laughs> i'm not trying to change a person uh you know Teachers who who take mechanical approaches to teaching, there's nothing wrong with that. You know, we need grammar, we need that, but there, you don't have to teach it in a, a, a like a, like drilling and fill in the blanks and multiple choice. And, you know, Absolutely you not. Uh, but, you know, if you just take like task based learning approaches, uh, uh, project based learning approaches, and let me just say something here about methodology. Mm -hmm. There's no silver bullet. <laughs> it's There's funny because it sometimes seems that people think there are, you know, they I remember going for an interview and somebody saying, which methodology, which methodology do you use? And I was just like. But I don't only use one. <laughs> you can't only use one. You can't go into a classroom with just this. This is the one way I'm going to teach because you you need to have other ideas. You need to have other bullets available, not just that that one bullet, as you say. Well, we don't want teachers walking into the room with bullets. Well, no, no, no. metaphorical bullets, metaphorical bullets. <laughs> but I, I, you're right, Harry we do need a, a sort of a, a, an array of methodologies. Uh, and so, so need to be exposed to many different kinds of methodologies. And, and but how can we do that? Well, that's where self-directed CPD comes in. Brilliant. Now, this is, uh, I'm so excited about talking to you about this because, you know, I've, I've, um, I've, I've seen a lot of what you put on online um, and a lot of it fan, for, for me personally is brilliant, you know, and what I love about the way you put things out there is you put out a lot of different things because the way I see it is everybody is different. So everybody needs different things. So if we are directing our own learning, then again, there isn't that one silver bullet for everybody. We all need something different. And, and I love how much you put out there for people. But um, what else can we do? What What is self-directed CPD and, and what's the best route to take? 
Well, you know, I had my own definitions of it. Uh, and, you know, we can talk about what uh, I think are some suggestions of, of improving. Mm -hmm. But I'm going to go to what Sarah Mercer uh, and uh, a few of her colleagues have recently come out with uh, from Oxford University Press. Uh, and uh, uh, Donald Freeman in that, in that publication, and I'm going to quote him, Okay, uh, says, uh, professional development is about engaging in learning to better understand what you do as a teacher. And it's not necessarily about fixing problems or improving or uh, updating. Uh, it's, it's because you want to do it. Mm -hmm. Uh, it, it, there has to be a willingness. Uh, and, exactly. Uh, you you want to improve yourself. You want to learn more. I, 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 well, uh, that really does strike a chord because, you know, you, you can't, like you mentioned, some people are untrainable because, you know, they don't have that desire to change. They don't have that, that drive to do something different. So... Okay. I'm feeding back quite a lot there. Uh, I'm just going to move to a different room. Yeah. Okay. Um, yeah. So it's so important uh, that there is that drive, there is that desire to to want to to learn something new and to to want to change, um, because without that, it's impossible. Now, I'd like to share a brief experience that I had very recently. Um, and it, it was in terms of um, self-directed CPD. Now, I had seen a course that a number of people had, uh, they'd been raving about online. So I fought my way onto the course and, and I got on the course and it, it was only a three week course and it was only five or six hours a week. And I, I really wanted to do it because I thought it would help me with my my course design, I thought it would be brilliant. So I was super excited. And then after the first week when, you know, instead of the the, the four to six hours I was suggested to do on it, it, it ended up taking me maybe eight or nine hours. Um, and I did not find it in any way engaging or enticing. And it didn't feel like it was um achieving the aims that i had hoped for and that had been suggested so you know when i tried to continue in the second week it just it became a huge weight on me and you know it was a thing that i was dreading on doing so in the end i've, I've currently half finished the course and i'm hoping to go back to it in the new year with like a new drive but i didn't but after i wanted to do it when i started but by the time i got into it i really didn't want to do it so yeah, what kind of advice do you have for me there? Well, I'd like to say that one of the reasons that people uh, lose interest in doing a, a CPD uh, is because they they just get demotivated after a while. Mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, we're adult, and I am talking about adult learning. Absolutely. Um, adults have other things going on in their life. Uh, they have families, they, they have children, they have to work, uh, and, you know, other things. Uh, and so this is going to happen. This is just going to happen that people will lose interest after a while. So one of my suggestions there is to, when you're going to be doing self-directed uh, CBD, do it in increments mm -hmm. uh, uh, and don't do it all at once, you know, like a crash course, because uh, that might not work for people. Because uh, just doing a crash course where you have to be away from home, away from work, um, from responsibilities, uh, that's going to cause stress. Yeah. Uh, so it's better to do it when you know you have some free time. Uh, and that's what I like about on-demand learning. 
uh, and self-directed learning. Uh, and this is why a lot of the courses uh, uh, that are offered in corporations use different methodologies because they know that people are busy, they have private lives, and they can't do everything at once or like in a week or a month. So that's what we call micro learning. Uh, Something you're an expert in, no less. What micro learning is about. It's um, um it, it it definitely was that that whole you know it, I seem to so this course started at the point of the year when I had the three busiest weeks of of my life at work as well so you know suddenly I I had three projects that were you know you know how it is with with publishers nowadays they need everything yesterday so suddenly I had all of these things that I had to finish now and then this course on top of it and I don't know it it just became that extra burden as you say so. It's not something you know I'm particularly proud of, and it's not something that tends to happen. You know, usually if I if I want to to learn something, I do take the more micro learning approach, or you know, I'll go to conferences or I'll go to webinars or, or those kind of things. Um, but yeah, this course it it beat me, Ron. It beat me, um, which I'm not proud to say, but it's absolutely true. You know, Harry, I'd like to take a step back and talk about how I got started with it for myself. Please and, do. Uh, a lot of people don't know that my Facebook site is actually like micro learning. Mm -hmm. uh, and I, I worked in a library for six years when I was in high school and also in university. So I, you know, really structured and and organized in that way. I like categorizing things. Yeah. And putting them in some kind of structure. And I didn't know how social media worked in the beginning. And so, and I'm very forgetful. <laughs> so I used my Facebook site to put all that stuff that I liked learning myself and would just put it there and share it with my colleagues. Mm -hmm. And they would go there and look at the stuff and they would share stuff too. Uh, so it was like kind of knowledge co-construction. Uh, and we just started sharing and learning with each other. Uh, and we formed a, a personal learning network. And But what I didn't know is that people were following me <laughs> on social media. And they were looking at that stuff I was posting. But they didn't know that I was putting it there for my colleagues and because I was forgetful. <laughs> so it was the way that I could always go back. So that's how I got started with it. Uh, and I realized that a lot of people were following me. You had a huge following, did you not, after, after not very long? Uh, well, I presently reached a... Uh, 1.2 million. That's, you know, that's quite a lot of people, Ron. That's quite a lot of people. They certainly wouldn't fit into one conference hall, that's for sure. Well, you know, there are teachers from all over the world. Uh, just everywhere. It's unbelievable. People write me. They ask me questions. And then I'll post something for them. Uh, but I can't answer every email. I can't answer every message. Uh, and, you know, a lot of people want to chat with me and I can't do that. Yeah. I, I have to work. <laughs> <laughs> it's one of those things we have to do, isn't it? So I've got a question for you that I'm sure a lot of people ask you. I'm sure this is one of the most common questions, and that's, how do I get started with self-directed CPD? Like, What's the first step? Well, you've got to want it for yourself. Mm -hmm. that, again, I'm going to repeat that word willingness. Uh, you, you sort of see a need. Uh, and that need comes from either your students telling you something. Uh, uh, maybe a colleague observes something. Or you observe something in a colleague. Uh, and so you want to do something about it. 
and you want to improve yourself. So the real key word there is reflection. Mm -hmm. And reflect on what you need, what what you want, uh, what's interesting for you. I think that is an absolute key there. On my Facebook site. Yeah, the, the idea of what's interesting to you for me is, you know, if you're going to get started on something, you absolutely have to start with something that you find interesting. If if you're going to be guiding yourself, you know, you can't just suddenly say, um, OK, so oof, I, I need to know X when it doesn't interest you at all, particularly for those first steps into CPD, you know, when you're trying to, to build that that momentum, as it were, you know, it's really important to, in my opinion, start with something you find interesting, or if you don't find it 100% interesting, at least useful. Well, it does have to be useful. And that's why I post tidbits. You know, uh, I know how people learn. And I, I know how adults learn. And so what I do is I mix things uh, and I'll usually mix the topics and, you know, it's about testing course books, of uh, uh, reflection, um, metacognition, uh, you know, science things, you know, just everything that a teacher could use, uh, lesson uh, yeah. ideas. You know, and I love it. I love that there is that variety. So when you do check, go to your Facebook pages, there's, there is such a wide variety. And, and like you say, you know, there is, it isn't one size fits all. Um, there are many different sizes and, and that variety that's out there is, is, it's just fantastic. And, and, and there is so much that, that you put out there that people can find. And, and there are so many like uh, webinars and conferences that people can go to because one of the, the big things that a lot of people I speak to is when you mention CPD, the first thing they talk about is cost. You know, I can't afford it. Now, obviously, you know, if you want to do the, the, the Delta or the, the dip T so then yes, that's going to cost you a lot of money. Of course it is. You know, these are, these are huge, these are huge certificates, but how could we do our CPD on a shoestring? Well, you know, Harry, that is a good question. <laughs> and I think you need to see how I put this together. Uh, and I'm going to mention three things right now. And uh, I don't want people to think that I'm promoting myself because I feel uncomfortable about that. I, I absolutely, I am very aware of that because you made that very, very clear in the, in the, um, in the build up to the show um, that you didn't want it to be about that. So um, yeah, just to, just to agree with you on that. I don't, point. Want people to, I don't want people to think I'm some kind of academic snob uh, or some kind of, you know, academic oriented researcher. You know, I, I want to deal with the practical stuff, mm -hmm. the stuff that we as teachers need in that classroom. Exactly. Uh, to help our students. So the first thing is my Facebook site. Uh, and, you know, there's something that I always have pinned. And that's how to use it. Yep. Uh, and it is self-directed learning. And I have some links there to Sarah Mercer's, uh, you know, talk about uh, self-directed learning uh, and also her publication and a few other people who I know talking about self-directed learning so to help people understand what it is. Uh, but then that's just my Facebook page, my personal page. But I yeah. also have another Facebook site and it's called Webinars for English Teachers. And so there we take teachers who like, you know, going to webinars uh, and that's that social aspect uh, so it, they're usually free uh, I would say 95% of them are I don't yep. like putting things there that cost money 
And the great uh, thing about this this page as well, I, I love it. Um, I, I absolutely, it's absolutely fantastic. You do put up so many different uh, webinars on there, and as you say, they are usually free. Um, and it that social side of things is so good as a as a learner um, to go into those webinars and and get that information firsthand. You know, you can. You know, you can you can sit there and you can listen and you can absorb all this information and you don't have to go out and get books and, and all of these different things. You can just learn from experts. You know what I've discovered, Harry, is, is that a lot of the teachers who go to these webinars, it's the only contact they have to native speakers or to uh, other people speaking English. Mm -hmm. So they go there not just for the content, but just to be around other people speaking English. Absolutely. And that's amazing. And, you know, people tell me that. And it has such they a wide reach. You know, a lot of, as we mentioned before, when we talk about the Delta or we talk about the, these other certificates, then, you know, it's typically wealthy, um, I'm going to say in inverted commas, global North uh, countries and people who, who, who do these courses. But, when it comes to these webinars, particularly the, the free ones, um, you get people from absolutely everywhere, absolutely everywhere, the across the entire planet will be in, in one of these webinars. And for me, it's, it's brilliant. Well, you know, everybody there is united by this ELT vibe. Yeah, but I need to say something there. Go ahead. That, that a lot of people who sign up for these webinars uh, sign up for them because they want a certificate. Uh, yes, that is so true. When they, you get in there, the first thing people say, how do I get my certificate? It's like, oh, come on. Come on. Like, <laughs> what value is this certificate to you anyway? Like, the certificate is of no value. What is of value is what the people are saying. It's so infuriating. Yes, yes. Uh, and I just ignore those comments. I don't, I don't ever answer them. In fact, when I say that I run a clean ship at webinars for English teachers, I mean it. Yeah. Uh, when I have the, the program set so that every time somebody asks about a certificate, their comment is deleted. Oh, fantastic. Uh, because, uh, and I add another one to them and I go, because they say, where's the link and how do I register? It was like, please read the details of the webinar. <laughs> the link is right there. Just click the link. It's right there. Like, or just read it. It's not that difficult. <laughs> yes. Oh, so often, so often, Ron. Oh, you've just you've just picked up like my two biggest bugbears when it comes to webinars. And yeah, the first one is the people who, who invariably come in for two minutes and say, where's my certificate? And, and like, as I mentioned before, you know, what value is a certificate of somebody going to a free webinar? Like when are, are they, they're not going to get a promotion based on that. Like the actual value of it is the content. And yeah, the other thing of, you know, where can I register for this? Well, just if you click on the link that I've sent to you, that shows you where to register. Yeah. Uh, and oh, it's it doesn't prove that they learned anything. Yeah, exactly. Uh, and so uh, I, I, I tell people who offer webinars uh, to be careful about that. Uh, because, you know, you're going to get a lot of people registering for your free webinars. And they don't care what you're saying. They're not listening to you. Yeah. You're not learning. No, I think that in this, there's like... There's a weird space here because the presenters of the webinars, people like yourself and myself, always go in there with that kind of the purest of intentions of going in there to, you know, share knowledge, to spread knowledge. Um, and then there's the the people who put the webinars on. So often like big publishers and, and so on and so forth. And, you know, they talk about, oh, there are 15,000 people registered for this webinar. You know, and you get to the webinar and in the end, it's, you know, there's a thousand people in there or something like that.
But what all they care about, or maybe not all they care about, but what they care about is the data. You know, the they want the 15,000 people registered. And if a thousand people come and learn, then great. But they've got the data of those 15,000 people now. So it's, you know, it kind of leaves that dirty taste in your mouth. That is called harvesting. Yes. <laughs> and there's very, you know, clever ways of doing it. And that's another wa reason why I run a clean ship. I don't allow anybody to harvest the teacher's information. Mm -hmm. I'm very careful of who I allow to oppose there. Uh, and uh, we got to be careful about what kind of webinars are being offered. Uh, yeah. Because there's really truly informational webinars. And that's great. You can learn from that. Uh, and, but then there's the infomercials. Uh, which are put on by a lot of publishers because uh, they want to sell books. Yeah. And they'll tell you about all the, the grand and glorious reasons why you should buy the book. But that doesn't mean that it's a good book. Uh, no, no, it doesn't. It, means it, could, it may have been presented well, but it does not mean it's a good book. That's absolutely for sure. So I certainly try and avoid those. Perfect. So I've got another question for you, Ron. Sorry, I've interrupted you again. Um, I'm t I've been terrible. Not having this, not being able to see you has absolutely destroyed me. It's really put me off. Um, I've got a question for you, Ron. And I'd like to know, I've seen and I've heard rumours um, that you will be starting something very exciting quite soon. Um I'm not going to I'm not going to say the name because I know that it's got it's got a wonderful ring to it. Um but I've seen that there's going to be a new podcast coming up. Um can you tell us about it? Yes. Oh, I'm so excited about this, Rob. That's the third leg of what I'm doing. So I started with my Facebook site microblog. Then I did the webinars for English teachers. And now I'm going directly to the experts. But the experts are going to be sharing their experience and experience and knowledge uh, with teachers all over the world. Uh, it's called Lesson Plan Jam. And I'm doing it with uh, some other people. Uh, and, uh, you know, it took us a while to plan it. Uh, and I just started working my network uh -huh. and asked people if they would be willing to participate. And Harry, I got over 150 responses. <laughs> so so what's, this, what's it going to be all about, Lesson Plan Jam? Well, you know, Lesson, lesson Plan Jam is, is about experts talking about certain topics uh, like assessment, uh, self-directed learning, mm -hmm. uh, like I said, uh, neuroscience, metacognition, testing, and let's let's not confuse testing with assessment. Absolutely not. Uh, and then uh, there's just so many other things in fact, let me just get let me just get to that list real quick because I can tell you what it is right now. Go for it. And uh, let me just get that. It's right here. Uh, where are you at? It's hiding. I know it, it's <laughs> hiding. It's uh, definitely yeah. under your coffee cup, Ron. Yes, it is. And here we go. Let me just, I have so many things on my desk here. Oh, I know, I know that feeling. While I'm, looking that. For that, uh, uh, while I'm looking for that, I just want to say that uh, we're going to have a great lineup of guests. Uh, and they're, you know, Lesson Plan Jam is going to be a monthly thing. Okay. And they're going to come out in bunches. 
and I'll usually do five or six interviews. Uh, and the teachers can choose what they want. So within each bunch, there's going to be something interesting for somebody. That's it's fantastic. It's again, it's like the way you run the you run your Facebook pages with the whole, you know, no silver bullet. It's that that spread that range for for everybody. That's right. Uh, and you know the way we're going to do it is is we want people talking about their projects and, and you know lesson plan gem is an international thing uh it's experts from all over the world we're not just going to get you know native speakers from the uk or the usa they're the worst we're going to <laughs> south america central america uh we're going to go to the caribbean uh, we're going to go all over Europe, Northern Europe, Southern Europe, Eastern Europe. Uh, we're going to the Middle East, North Africa, India, uh, China, uh, Japan, Australia, New Zealand, everywhere. It's just such a, a widespread of, of professionals. And, and something I love when you, you know, when you learn from people in all the, these different areas in all these different places they all have their own unique approach not only to teaching but also to learning and you know so a lot of the the teachers that I work with um you know particularly uh, in India they they have a, a very different approach to to the way they teach and the way they learn as well and and as a teacher trainer myself it's wonderful to have that spread of people you know, in, in a course or, you know, in a, in a room, he says in inverted commas, because of course it's a zoom room. Um, so yeah, having this, this diverse range of, of experts, it's, it's perfect for anybody who's looking to, to direct their, their CPD themselves. It's very true. You know, everybody's working in and living in another context. Uh, and, uh, you know, there's one person who's going to talk about emergent language, and not just one, several. Uh, but we're going to be talking about young learners and the different kinds of young learners. Uh, and then we're going to cover skills like how do you teach reading, well, writing, you speaking, uh, and how about integrating technology, uh, and what about graphic facilitation? Oh, uh, are you going to be speaking to Emily by any chance? Uh, well, um, I can't name any names right now. Oh, you say that and that. Oh, you're such a tease. You're such a tease. Oh, wait. As soon as I hear graphic facilitation, there's one name that pops into my mind. So um, I'm, I won't spoil it for anyone, of course. Uh, I no spoiler, Terry. No spoiler. Oh, absolutely not. Absolutely not. So there's a. Uh, it just sounds fantastic that, that all of this stuff is going to be available to people at the at the touch of a button. Um, and it's something that I've tried to you do on, really on Teachers Talk Radio is to have that kind of broad spread. But yeah, it's going to be fantastic. So what's the structure of the show going to be? Well, you know, people do need to talk about their context, talk about their story, mm -hmm. tell us where they're at, what they're doing. Uh, and because you know that's interesting in and of itself, yeah. but that's not learning. <laughs> so, the learning part of lesson plan jam is the takeaway. So, we ask our experts to share 10 things that they want and or they feel that teachers need to know. And uh, there are going to be 10 tips, 10 suggestions, recommendations, some advice. Uh, and uh, teachers want you know, to know that when they invest time in something like this, that they want a takeaway. Of course, 100%. Those, those 10 tips. Oh, that's fantastic. And that will be, you know, you know, being able to take those 10 things away with you. Now, I know when I go to a talk or to a conference or even to a webinar, I don't just want, you know, pure theory. You know, I, I want practical because 
you know, I've gone to that webinar or that that talk. I want you know some of my lessons to have been planned for me. You know, I want to be able to to go into my classes the next day or or the next week and have something there that's ready to go straight away. So it seems like this is something that you know we'll be able to take. You know, with these takeaways, we'll be able to throw straight into our lessons. Exactly. Uh, you know. I've been to almost every conference in the world. Uh, I've been to all of them and, and I've seen the great speakers and I've seen the not so great speakers. Uh, and one of the things that, um, that makes a great workshop or, uh, you know, a, a talk is the takeaway. Yeah. Uh, and I've talked to teachers at conferences and I'll ask them, what was your takeaway on that? And they'll think and they'll say, I don't know. It is it's something that, about, you know, we need to, to work into it. There needs to be an obvious takeaway at the end of, of the end of a session. Definitely. Mm -hmm. That's true. Uh, and I think that's relevant to, to all aspects of, you know, in terms of lessons as you know, when we're teaching as well, you know, it's not just with our own learning. It's not just with when we're giving training sessions, but when we're teaching in the classroom as well, if the, if the student leaves at the end of the class and, and they have nothing to take away from that class, then, you know, you, you as a teacher, you know, they, they, they're not going to remember that class. They're not going to remember what they've learned. So there needs to be some kind of takeaway, even in our lessons as well, not simply in our, in our professional development. Well, you know, when you go to a conference, uh, there's a catalog and you have to pick your, you know, workshops that you want to go to. Uh, and why should lesson plan jam be any different? So you decide to go to lesson plan jam and you're given a choice of five or six things and you sit down and learn. Yeah. You have time. That is exceptional. <laughs> that is exceptional. So Ron, I'm just going to shoot off now for, for two minutes. If you could hang around with us, that would be absolutely marvelous. We're just going to jump off for a couple of minutes. And then when we come back, we'll, we'll close things off for the end of the show. So I'm just going to shoot off now. Uh, and we're going to, uh, we will be back. This show is brought to you in partnership with John Cat Educational, a leading publisher of books, directories, educational guides and magazines specifically aimed at forward-thinking schools in the UK and beyond. Have you checked out their latest releases? Don't miss out. Visit johncatbookshop.com to explore their full range of titles and advance your own professional development today. Happy reading. This episode of Teachers Talk Radio has been made possible with support from Witherslack Group, the UK's leading provider of SEN education and care. They're here to support you too through an ever-growing offer of free resources, including webinars, podcasts, articles and events aimed at supporting teaching professionals like you. Visit their website at www.weatherslackgroup.co.uk to find out more. This is Teachers Talk Radio, and this is Teachers Talk Radio News. We are back before the, the final countdown, as it were. Um, so, hey there, Ron. Uh, can you still hear me? I think so. Can you hear me? Oh, I can. I can. I was nervous. I was nervous. I'm not going to pretend I wasn't nervous after... After, let's be honest, the debacle with the kickoff, um, I was absolutely terrified. Um, so I do have one quick question, if it's okay for me to ask you. Now, I have seen um, the, I, I want to say, it's, I, 
I don't know why, but I auto go into Spanish when I do this because it's called propaganda. But the 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 flyers, I've seen the flyers to um, to Lesson Plan Jam, and there's somebody else on there that I've seen now. Who is your co-host? Can you share that with us at the very least? Well, yes, I can, Harry. In just a second, I want to get over to a page as I'm looking for something else. Okay, then. It's, I'm not, it's just not me. It's not just you alone, is it? You do have a, a very, very wonderful, um, in fact, one of my, my, my 50th ever guest on the show. Um, so anybody who was listening into the 50th show will absolutely know who I'm talking about. Um, one of my absolute favorite people in ELT, I have to say. You know, when I was looking for a partner, a co-host, I'm not just the host by myself. I searched and I looked at everybody that I knew. And one day I was on LinkedIn and I saw Silvina and, you know, Silvina Masiti. And I have to say that I did my research. Oh, yes. And I started seeing who she was. And I thought, you know, I don't really know her that well. Uh, and I know a lot of teachers in the world. But I thought, why don't I just invite her as a guest? And so we met. And, you know, she thought I was interviewing her to be a guest. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the conversation was going very well. And then I just threw it at her. <laughs> and I told her, Sabina, I need to tell you why I'm really calling you. <laughs> and she was shocked. <laughs> I can and imagine. She, can I have some time to think about it? I'm so happy that she said yes, because she is, um, she's one of those very, very special people. She's, uh, she's, she's a rare breed there. There aren't so many, you know, she's, she is more than just a teacher. She is more than just a materials writer. She's, she definitely has that X factor. That's for sure. Well, I think we complement each other. I'm sure you do. You know, well, I like the way Sylvina described me. Oh, how was that? A German American multicultural senior. Oh. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it's true. Yeah. Uh, and uh, she comes from Argentina, lives in Spain. Uh, and, you know, we speak English with one another, even though I speak Spanish. So, Yo también. Uh, you're more comfortable. <laughs> It's very true. I mean, when, whenever I speak to her as well, we always speak in English. Um, I think we may have had one or two words here and there in Spanish, but it, it just feels, you know, natural to, I don't know. Um, I, I, I just always assume as well that everybody else's um, second language or third language or even fourth language is always better than my second, third or fourth language. So um, people, I, I tend to, to go with English, but yeah, she's... I, I cannot praise you enough on finding such a, a wonderful co-host and I, I'm very excited to, to hear um, everything that, that's going to happen on the, on the uh, on Lesson Plan Jam. It's going to be amazing and I know the work you're putting into it is um, it's exceptional and, and it's going to be something really big, I think, and it's going to be something that really does make a huge difference uh, in people's self-directed CPD. I think it's important to say that we don't want to be speaking to the choir, uh, you know, to the converted. Yeah. In other words, uh, experienced teachers. Uh, and that's the mistake that a lot of people make at conferences. Uh, they sit there and give a 45 minute talk that bores people who already know everything about that. Oh yeah, it's so it's so. When, there's something I talk about whenever I, I speak to people, and it's 
It's when I started doing talks back in 2012, 2013, and I was going to conferences, when people sat there and they just talk in, in what I call TEFL talk. You know, they just throw out jargon, TEFL jargon, you know, things that they've learned on their Delta. And, you know, the, you know, the layman, the layperson isn't going to care about that. The people who are just, you know, there who have just qualified, you know, people who really need this information, you know, if you start talking to them about elision when you're talking uh, about pronunciation, you're just going to lose them straight away. It needs to be, you know, it needs to be pitched at a level that isn't for people who have all done their delta. You know, when you're doing CPD, it needs to be something that is ready, easily digestible. Exactly, Harry. <laughs> Thank you for saying that. <laughs> uh, you know, we're we're targeting. Uh, teachers all over the world, younger teachers, people stepping into the, the job who need to learn things. Uh, and uh, a lot of people can't afford to go to, uh, to uh, paid webinars. Uh, they can't afford to travel to a conference. And I think it is the responsibility of more seasoned teachers, those who have had a privilege to work in this industry, it's time to get them to share. Uh, and I'm calling them to bat, step up to the plate, uh, and share your knowledge uh, with the younger ones. The ones exactly who that. Are in a situation that they can't afford to go to a conference. Uh, but you know, we know we're going to have some seasoned teachers there too, listening to us. Well, that's the, the funny thing is because there are obviously like all these newly qualified teachers out there who you know they have usually have this desire to to learn and improve. But then there are the the people like myself and and you know a lot of other people who who we are seasoned teachers and teacher trainers. But we'll see something that you know we don't know enough about. And we want to learn more about it. So, you know, we have that kind of drive and obsession with learning. So, you know, we'll go for that as well. And even as seasoned teachers and seasoned professionals, ELT is not exactly the highest paid profession in the world. So it's sometimes, you know, it's not even easy for us to, to go to certain conferences. No, you're right. Uh, and when I was thinking of a name for for this, I actually thought of, well, why don't I call it lesson plan masterclass? Mm -hmm. And because, you know, a masterclass is when somebody's an expert, a SME, uh, and uh, they want to share things with you that they know. Uh, and uh, when I thought, okay, I'll do this. I went to a lawyer. Oh, wow. And I couldn't. Oh, no. Somebody had taken it. Because, well, no, because the master class is a registered trademark. Oh, wow. And I couldn't use it. I would probably get in trouble. But the good thing is Lesson Plan Jam has a really cool sound to it. And it it's probably it would be more appealing to to the kind of target audience. It sounds more like, you know what, we're going to sit down, we're going to talk about stuff, it's going to be fun, it's going to be great, you know, like as if you were jamming with music, you know, whereas a lesson plan masterclass, maybe that would sound like, hmm, I'm going to have to yeah, yeah. take everything with me and it's going to be tough. So it has that kind of, not informal, but it has that kind of, I don't know. It has a, a vibe to it that sounds really appealing. Well, Harry, who doesn't like jam? Exactly. Uh, so, you know, we all like jam. I mean, we think, you know, uh, you know, get a piece of toast and spread some jam on it and eat it and, you know, have some coffee, you know, uh, and have that's your breakfast. And that was the first thing I thought about. You know, sit down, listen to somebody, an expert, uh, while you're having your, your breakfast and coffee uh, or tea. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, or, you know, when we put it together and, you know, there's five or six choices, 
So, you know, it's a lot of things jammed together mm -hmm. and you can decide what you want. So that's sort of how I came up with it. Well, I like it. I have to say it's very appealing. So um, we're, we're coming in, as I mentioned before, to the to the home straight, as it were. Uh, I think I've been in every room in my house so far today, bar the living room, uh, to try and make sure I had decent reception and decent sound. So um, this really has been a tour of a of a um, of an episode. So I have to say a huge thank you for your patience at the start. Um, I don't really know what happened there. I'm going to blame the moving of offices. That's almost certainly got something to do with it. Um, but as we are moving into the, the, final, um, the final stretch, I'd like to know, we mentioned it before, but what would you like people's takeaways to be from today uh, when talking about self-directed CPD? What would, be your, what would you hope people take away from today's show? Thank you for asking me, Harry because this should also have a takeaway. And I would like to talk about 10 things about what you should think about when you go to a CPD event or you come to lesson plan jam. And number one is we all have personal expectations. Uh, and we know that when we walk into a room that those personal expectations will affect of how we learn. So let's keep those expectations realistic. Uh -huh. The second thing is we have assumptions and attitudes and beliefs about what learning and teaching is. And that will also affect your uh, your, your self-directed learning. Uh, so you got to deal with that too. And you need to ask yourself, what are those? Yeah. You know, what are my assumptions and attitudes about learning and teaching? Number three uh, is you need to reflect uh, and ask yourself, uh, how am I doing things now? Uh, do I see anything missing? Uh, do I want something special? Uh, and uh, how am how have I done things in the past? And, and mm -hmm. in comparison to how I did things in the past and I'm doing things now, how have I improved? Or have I improved? Uh, and how do I want to do things in the future? In the future. Number four is you need to look at your classroom experiences and you as you, that, that teacher in the room, and that's called classroom persona. What is your classroom persona? Think about it and reflect on it because that's what you're gonna be bringing to a self-directed uh, CPD uh, event. Mm -hmm. And number five is connect your CPD, uh, the choices you make to that, to your teaching learning context. Uh, what is your teaching learning context? Uh, and you want to, you know, start adding to that. Uh, and, and so if you're teaching, you know, children, primary school, uh, then try to go in that direction. Uh, but if you're teaching teenagers, well, that's a little bit different. And try to find something in that direction. If you're working with university students, uh, see if you find anything about university students. Uh, and the next thing you need to think about is uh, being open-minded. Absolutely. You know, you've got to be open minded to things. Uh, you're going to be hearing a lot of stuff. It, uh, things are new. Uh, and some of it, you know, might make you think about yourself. So you've got to do a lot of self uh, realizations are going to happen. 
Yeah. And you can deal with it. Uh, and that leads to the next thing. And that means if you really want to try what you're learning, then take it to the classroom and take some risk uh, and just do something new. See what works. Uh, innovate what you learned. Uh, and ask your students what they think. Mm -hmm. uh, get some feedback from them. Absolutely. That's something that we often forget um, as teacher trainers. You know, we go in and we, we train all these things and we tell people to go and do it, but then we don't tell them to check with their students if that it's actually any use. Well, I need to add to that. And that is after you've tried something out, uh, get with some colleagues and share your experiences mm -hmm. and ask them what they think. Or even better, ask them to come in and see what you're doing and ask them to observe you and give you feedback. Absolutely. And there's nothing better than feedback from a colleague. Uh, and the next thing is, is you need to find out what's going on out there. Uh, what, you know, what are the market forces? And we know that one of them is technology. 100%. And so how are you integrating technology? Uh, and uh, what could you add? What could you learn that could make your lessons more engaging uh, by integrating technology? So pick a technology workshop every now and then. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, the last thing is this desire, this this willingness that you you have to learn. You've got to accept that being a teacher means lifelong learning. Absolutely. So you that's I think the most important thing. Be a lifelong learner. It'll make you happier in your job. You'll be more satisfied. Uh, your students will be happier. Uh, your employers might be happier. I'm, I'm certain they would be. Uh, but in the end, accept that being a teacher means learning. Always learning. And it's not always about improving yourself, but just getting different perspectives. Uh, and hearing other people speak about things that that are interesting to you. And so those are my points and the takeaways from today's talk. That was fantastic and very succinct, Ron. Um, absolutely wonderful. Um, so I am, I'm going to head back, I'm going to brave it. I'm going to head back into the office and see if I could head back into the studio. Sorry, not the office, the studio. This is radio after all. And see if I can... Uh, terminate this show as it were because this is the final show of 2022 from me so i want to say a huge thank you to you for coming along today ron um it was absolutely wonderful absolutely brilliant and i cannot wait um for the new developments coming up next year thank you harry for inviting me it's been an absolute pleasure and i look forward to having you on lesson plan jam so that is it for 2022. Thank you, everybody, for, for coming along and listening. It's been an amazing 2022. And I am going to play you out with the wonderful Teachers Talk Radio theme tune for the last time this year. You've been listening to Teachers Talk Radio. Tune in live and listen back at ttradio.org. We look forward to hearing from you next time on Teachers Talk Radio.